for some days we've been looking at raising a global army of um, icons, people who have been so equipped that in various fields, in various aspects of their being, they are more than able to contend to face whatever challenges that they have. So the idea is to build capacity. The idea is to strengthen. The idea is to raise people who face every challenge head on and be capable of overcoming. And so today we have some seasoned, as I said, servants of God who will share practical life experiences, certain challenges they themselves face. Sometimes, you know, some of us think that pastors don't have challenges at all. As far as me to pray, God just comes down and begins to shake and um, we don't have challenges. But we have asked them to share practical life experiences. Again, we would have an opportunity for you to, um, whatever question you may have, whatever issues um, that is bothering your heart or your mind, they are more than willing to share their practical experiences with you. So let your questions start coming. I'll be monitoring. Um, also, my uh, dear sister Prisla is around. She would also be monitoring. And if there are any challenges, um, she will let you know. I I'm sure she'll put a, a contact on the line so that those of you who have challenges, she will address it. So I want to welcome each and every one of you, friends on social media, friends all over the place. God richly bless you. We began by saying that God created the world with his word. He created the whole universe, this mighty world with his word. And because of his sovereignty and because he created everything by his spirit, we believe that there is a kind of a connection between God and all his creation. God is able to speak, is able to connect. In fact, the Bible says that let the mountains clap their hands. And the Bible talk, talks about how we can learn lessons from serpents, from horses. And so for some days now, we've been looking at what lessons we can learn from horses. As I've indicated, we will not be able to go over and over again. If not, we will never make progress. But just give a recap of what we did last uh, week. We said that uh, one of the strength of a horse is their capacity to smell. To, so we apply by saying that they can sense, they can detect, they can feel, even when you've not spoken, they can smell predators, they can smell trays, they can smell and, and be able to move within that smell, even, even if they don't see. We also said that they have great footprint recognition so the horses are said that even if you blindfold them and you you ride them to a place and you think that look because i've gone to i mean i'm in ghana because i've they, they, we've moved to south africa the countries they are they are supposed to have, you you'll be joking they would be able to smell and trace their footsteps. and so we said that in our journey of life god every experience we have god uses it as a footprint as a record as a yardstick that could be helpful whether they are mounting experiences whether they are valley experiences whether they are exciting experiences whether they are horrible terrific disturbing experiences we are saying that all those pages of your life from the very day you were born to this day that we are speaking god has arranged all those things for a purpose and that God intends it for your good. Whether it's good or bad, God is able to turn it around. So our past is not intended to be an, a, a hold, a stronghold over our lives and begin to say that because I was born in a manger, I cannot succeed, or because I was born, my father died early, my mother died early because of the misfortunes that I've had. We said that all those things are springboards for us to be uh, able to, do that. But you know, before we go into the discussion, before I let my panels 
coming. I have one of our sisters all the way from South Africa, our sister Pateka. And uh, very soon I will release her. She'll give us some nice song. But um, before, before we let her sing, let's just give her a background of today so that when she ministers along the line, you would enjoy her music. We are people connecting from different parts of the world. And so we, we should be ministering in Zulu. Um, uh, and we would enjoy the South African rainbow flavor uh, very soon. So we are saying that those are the lessons we learned and that everything that happens in life, God can use it for our good. Now today, what we want to do is to go a step further still with the issue of um, contending with horses. I'll just give about five minutes um, introduction to what we intend doing today. As I said today, I will not be doing a lot of the talking. We have three strong personalities here. They are, every question, ask them all the questions uh, since your mother gave birth, you, you've not been able to ask. Uh, Apostle Nanaya uh, has the authority to answer every question. So <laughs> just relax. <laughs> So all the experiences of your life, the challenges you've gone through, they will share theirs and we will share ours. We, today we are just looking at the, um, still on the issue of horses, but an aspect that we want to learn is their ability to understand movement. What, what is the meaning of that? When a horse is um, <laughs> just, the horse is there, and there's a prey coming. The steps, they will know that this is a tiger, this is a lion, this is a bear, just by the movement. The, the horses said that when the master is coming, the steps, they will know that this is a master coming, this is the servant. So they understand movement, they understand seasons. And so we are saying that to be somebody who can stand the test of time, you must understand movements. You must understand what God is doing. You must understand when you are in your peak of life. Sometimes when God begins to give you exciting moments, everything seems to be prosperous. Some, everything seems to glow. It may not last forever. Your capacity to know that this season is meant as a reservoir for you so that when times of scarcity comes, you would have enough to spare and to also enjoy. But the challenge is that quite a number of us, quite a number of us, we are not able to know that the season of abundance in my life is intended maybe when there's a season of lack, maybe when there's a season of lack. And so we must understand the seasons of our life and be able to know how we are going to work on it. So that if there are difficult moments, there are times that everything you are doing doesn't seem to work. You prayed, you fasted, it doesn't seem to work. Certain situations, doesn't seem to fall in place and you'll be wondering, oh my God, what is happening? All those seasons are meant to help um, your, your life. So ability to know the times and the season. You see, if your season comes and you do not make the best of it, when it passes away, it may take you another year or it may be lost forever. And so it's important we understand when our season is in, when is the best of our times and when to take advantage of it. So in preparing for the various seasons, I will not go too much today, but to, in preparing for the various seasons, we said, if you recall what I said earlier, I said that we're trying to raise an army and those in the army go through strict training in preparation for possible challenges. I don't know of any country's army who would wait until there's war before they will prepare. Most people, even when in the season of peace, they will still create jungle experiences in preparation for possible challenges. What is the implication of what I'm saying? In our life, we must sometimes, um, what word should I use? Stage, or we must sometimes um, kind of act, create possible scenarios of our lives. Assuming this happens in my life, how will I face it? Most of the time, we are afraid of thinking negative. We are afraid of, um, possibility of negatives or challenges or difficulties.
Okay, so um, just a moment. <laughs> okay, all right, uh, the internet went off, so sorry for that. I hope I'm back now. All right, so we are saying that you need to prepare for possible challenges that may come. Stage it. Pretend that you're going through that situation. And then when that situation comes, you'll be able to stand for it. And that is, that is what an army does and in preparation for any possible challenge that may come their way. You must also understand that there are generational gaps, situational gaps. I, I, I would want to hold on with this aspect. And then when maybe next week or if there's still time, I'll come back to it. And what I mean by this, the other possible challenge you face, I've talked about in preparation for possible challenges. So don't wait till the challenge comes. Create scenarios, create possible situations and find solutions to it. And I'm saying that uh, the other challenge that you may face in church, in business, in life, I'll just talk about this and then we'll continue. That's not the end of the challenges. I don't want to take too much from Apostle's time. Uh, so the next two, three minutes, I'll be up. The other challenge you will face is that of what I refer to as the generational gap syndrome. The generational gap here is not with reference to age difference. No, that's not what I'm trying to say. But I'm trying to say that sometimes people who begin something, let's take the church, for instance. There's always the perception that those who started the church, are, they are more spiritual, they know better, they, they are more passionate than those who join later. You go to a cop a corporate with a business environment and somebody who started a company, those who started a business, you come to uh, ministries, those who were there have kind of an ownership. They think that we came early and we are better. And then those who came later sometimes also have a mentality that we just, we because we are good, that's what we've been brought on board, because we are professional, because we are this, so there's always that tension. And these are possible challenges you will face in work, in life. Sometimes your own father thinks that uh, you are his child, even when you are 50 years or 40 years. These are all challenges, the reality of the situation. And in the church, I recall when, again, I always use the example uh, of some of the practical things I faced. I was the youth director, and then we were teaching that year on um, building according to the Pentecostal pattern. And then there was this. Went for a program somewhere. I was there. This is what people say. I was there. And then the, this young man had dressed nicely in his white tie, but the tie was a bit short. The tie was uh, not a long, normal tie. The other son said, hey, gentlemen, come, come, come. Then he brought him in front and said, this is not Pentecostal pattern. And the way he embarrassed, <laughs> the, way he embarrassed the, the, uh, the young guy, so tie becomes a Pentecostal part. Why this thing? Because, you know, they are used to a particular way of doing things. And you must have that understanding that these are real challenges that we face. But you see, this is the beauty of God himself. God, in nature, we have, see, when you look at even plants, we have seedlings. We have, as they grow, then some are in, at different stages. And that is how life is. We would never all be at the same time. And I have a challenge with companies and organizations who would always insist that you must come to this company with five years experience, 10 years experience. Who should go and train them for you to have the experience? And what is experience? Somebody may not be experienced in IT, but may be experienced in wisdom, in reasoning, may be experienced in managing conflicts. And so if you insist that you must come with only this experience, you may end up losing some people who could have been beneficial. Sometimes the people who are not, yes, you need experienced people, we need experienced people, people who know their field in that area, definitely. But you also need a blend of people who may not be experienced in that particular field, but could also be useful. And then you realize that when there's that combination of experience, inexperienced, knowledgeable, not being knowledgeable, that brings the beautiful blend of life. Life itself is made up of experience and inexperience. Life is made up of similarities and differences. Life is made up of variety. And to be able to contend with challenges, you must have that art to be able to make give room for those who are inexperienced, 
give room for the very experienced, give room for those who are too known, give room for those who are not too known, all the different varieties will come in. I have tried to say that the reality is that these are some of the challenges we may face. Now, I want us to look at practical things that some of us have faced. And very soon, I'll hand over to Apostle Nanaya Ajay. And Apostle Nanaya is the manager for Pentecost Convention Center. And the good news is that, you see, when they sent a lot of our COVID brothers there, they have been healed and they were rejoicing. You saw it all over social media. This is a man who understands his job. He's been a missionary. And so he's a married man. He's a family man. He has young guys in his house who, who, who always question, lots of questions. So uh, I'm sure he'll be more than in a good position to answer us. Contending with hosts, being able to face the challenges, understanding the possible challenges you face, and I've chosen only one, the generational differences, the experience differences, the various differences that may come. Before we continue, I will now ask my dear sister, Pateka Boy, to give us, to soothe in the environment with a very nice, uh, tune, nice Zulu tunes, my dear. So you have the floor now. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, the song that I'm about to render is um, a Zulu song, but it simple means that being able to listen to the Holy Spirit in every challenges that you are going through in whatever that you are going through, but being able to listen to the Holy Spirit. And it goes like this. Oh, yeah, la le la, oh, so manja, e bono, maisimo, inga vumi, oh, uguna le la, esinisikati, Ubiza, ugo pila wetu, oh, ya la lelwa, ebo uso manja, ebo ugo na lela, esi nyisikati, ubiza, ugo pila wetu, ebo u. Ya la lelwa, e bungulu, ngulu, e bo uya la lelwa, ay bo u so manta, no mano maisimo, so nasi gavu. God bless you. Wow. That's my dear sister, all the way, connecting all the way from South Africa. We're happy to have you, my dear sister. And uh, God richly bless you for that glorious song. Very soon, we hope that Professor Osafo um, and the wife would also be joining if they are not already there. But before we take your questions, I will now want to hand over to uh, the Apostle to share his own personal experience. What are some of the things that he's come face to face with and what does he have to tell us? Hmm. Apostle General. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Apostle Ike. I want to uh, first of all thank God for such an opportunity. And there's no better time than this time 
contending with horses. And some of us can really align ourselves with uh, what is going on. Because life, doing your introduction, I think you gave me everything I needed to say. Because life is not bed of roses. And Robert Schuller said that you must learn to turn your scars into stars. There are two soldiers. One is at a military base, 18 three times with nice medals. One is also on the war front. By the time he's coming back, he's limping. When you are to give advice, you are to take an advice from any of these two. The one who has not had any challenges, so to speak, will start a statement, if I were you. But anybody who advises and say, if I were you, is a failure. But the person who has really gone through and contended with the horses, will tell you, sit down. I did it this way, do it this way, and you'll make it. Quickly. Uh, my man is cast back when I hit Kibbeh. In fact, when I was in Senegal, waiting for I had to be in the airport for 30 hours waiting for a flight to be fed. And the person I expected comfort from told me that. And it's in line with what they are talking about. Can I continue? Sure, continue. Yes, sir. He said, well, my, my place is tough, but where you are going is tougher than mine. That was the first word of comfort. So when I hit the place, in fact, even the person to give me direction to where the church is was a difficulty. And normally when you meet such things, it toughens you up. And there, there are some kind of horses, you meet them and you think that that is your end. Because the next day, we were in two, I was just two days in the town when the police came for me. That the person who, where we are we were living, the person who painted the room stole the paint. So I should go and fish out the painter and how, how, where the stolen goods came from. And I did not hear any word in Portuguese. No word in Portuguese. And I was supposed to explain in Portuguese. So I sat in the police station from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. waiting for commander to come and adjudicate my case. And every tongue I needed to blow, I blew it inside. <laughs> and the thing will not turn. And those who, are, who know Kivet, every police station, there is an underground. If you are a foreigner and you are not telling the truth, they take you to the dark room and subject you to severe beating for, for the truth to gush out of your, your mouth. When the commander finally came and they were to listen to me, I mean, I could feel the horses contend with me so much because I didn't know anybody to call. I didn't have anybody. And all that I could do was to respond in the Portuguese words with tongues. So, for example, if they ask me a question, I'll go Kabe Baru Zayan Data. When it continued, and they, I saw that they were confused, I realized that this would give me some breather. So I remember the song that says that. In other words, once I know that Jesus is a conqueror, and once you mention the name, Satan is afraid, I'll continue. So I used tongues to blow it for about seven minutes, and the man just woke up in anger and said, Abo Dodo. Use a sign language to tell me that you are mad. Go away. <laughs> I left. And I realized that if this is madness, the madness is very enviable. Because if this alone will, will give you a breather. This is to set the tone for what man suffered. Practically, the first time I saw my father, I was around 15, 16 to 17 years. And this is a man who was a deputy auditor general in Ghana. But I couldn't see him. I, I could not see him. Due to life challenges. And if these things happen to you, it will tell you and your following that though your beginning is small, when you were, you were speaking, I, my mind was cast back to where Jesus was born. Jesus was not born in a cathedral, neither was he born in a palace. But from the manger, all these things are there to tell us that there are, there are horses man need to contend with. I thank you when you said generationally. When one generation passed, you think that Oh, those people, they did very, they were very spiritual. Well, it's good. But we are also, because the things man has gone through until you, you listen 
you never know the amount of things you have suffered before coming to stand and speak. Um, mm. I, I think that when I face these things, this thing toughened me. It is at that place that I learned the art of prayer in its intensity, how to read the Bible over and over. And I was forced to learn Portuguese day and night. And by the police who came for me and the rest, later on, I had access to teach the president of the nation English. So, um, beloved, life is full of positive and negatives. And once you are able to overcome both, you get your light. Because negatives alone will not give you. Positive alone will not give you. But it's the blend of the two. Thank you for now, sir. Great. That, that is a, a very powerful experience. Um, tongues. <laughs> tongues <laughs> have the capacity to create opportunities when there are um, no opportunities when the doors have been shut. And that is a very good practical life experience that our dear Apostle has shared with us. So we just want us to be reminded that the idea is that we as Christians, as people who live in this world, if we don't face challenges, we cannot become the gem or the pearl. Can you become the gem or the pearl that God wants you to be? So challenges are intended to toughen us, to sharpen us, and to make us better people. Uh, I've seen that Prof has joined. Um, so very soon, we'll take his also thoughts. Uh, I'm sure he's been following one way or the other. So very soon, we'll take his thoughts on some of these things. But we want you to follow the discussion. If you have any questions, let us have it. If you're going through a particular challenge, let us have it. Very soon, we'll throw some few questions that are also around. Maybe Apostle, take note of this question. Okay. Um, somebody is asking um, one of the toughest decisions you've ever made in, 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 in your life, in terms of ministry. One of the toughest decisions that you've made. You may think, you may consider it and then later um, you may want to share your thoughts on those things mm -hmm. with with us all right so we are saying that as christians we have been wired and take <laughs> note of the words i'm using we have been wired mm -hmm. to content with false horses. We have been wired to be able to um, to be able to face any challenge. And that is why God said, God himself said that if you have fought with men, just men on foot, and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses um i don't know if prof prof is on now prof can you hear me we want to hear your thoughts before we continue is prof there Prof, I think your mic is, uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Prof, can you hear me now? I've, um... All right, whilst Prof is working hard to connect with us, let me just, just give me a few moments to check a few things. All right, so we are still in contending with whatever challenges there are. I, Apostle, I don't know whether you would want to attempt that question that someone has brought. Okay. Um, 
we have made it very clear that this platform is not a preaching platform. It's not a platform where we come and just preach and preach and preach and preach. It's a platform where we want to encourage people to have their issues brought up. We have a discussion. We have a, a great interaction. And okay. um, that is why some of you are. So what is the toughest decision you've made in your life? I mean, well, not necessarily. Well, you may want to tell us your general life or your ministry life. Yeah. Um, thank you, sir. I, the toughest I can remember, among others, is when I had written to Auditor General's office that mm -hmm. I will no more be an auditor. I wanted to be Auditor General in future, but I had to discard that because I thought it was not possible. And later on, I moved to UK. And when I was in UK, I had worked three weeks and I had to return empty-handed to the Bible school to come wow. and start work all over again. Meanwhile, I had written to my families that, Jack, where I am, I am doing three types of jobs, but it is very cheap. I'm still fine. I mean, I'm strong. This thing, in a few moments, I will turn people's lives up, upside down. But I think I had to come. And what word am I going to tell these people? And more so, I knew that when we come to this place, where you are going, you have no idea. So to test of somebody from the village like me, hitting UK, not now, but we are talking about some 19 years ago, hitting the place with a, a very paid, good paid job in Catford, somewhere in the Southeast London. And you are like, ah, to, to return, difficult. So I had to travel to uh, Professor Opoko Nina that time. So I needed a word from him to say, oh, don't go. When I went, <laughs> and the, man, the man is deep. He gave me a book entitled, When God Says Well Done by R.T. Kendall. When God Says? Well Done. Well Done. Wow. Yes. And I, I didn't even check until I came home. I said, ah, this man, I went to him confused. And I've returned double confused. I needed a straight jacket answer. And I, I, I couldn't get it. So I called home and told my wife that, as for this, it's very tough. Because even the money I travel with, some are loans I've not paid. So to come empty-handed, and people know that you are a bugger and there's nothing in your pocket and you're going to start. This one, I will not. Until the... Uh, the man told me that the, the Bible also says, what can I provide a man? Then some other the coaster wears and the rest and watch me. Uh, I'm confused and, and took a decision to come down. And in the flight, I wept till I touched Ghana. Because mm. I didn't know whether I was in the right. So the first week, met the school, asked me whether I was feeling all right. And I mean, I was not following anything and I would not go to eat and I was fasting all through and I look very miserable. It's like you have been conscripted into an army. That was mm. the hardest decision I, I took. In fact, in life, that's how I can remember now. Thank you. It, it looks like ministry, uh, most pastors have had come into ministry as one of the toughest decisions in their life. And it, it's, it's interesting. I don't know why it's almost often the case. When people are going into ministry, it becomes so difficult a decision for them to take. Whereas other people too hmm, are fighting to be to become ministers by all means. Ah. It's amazing. And but normally those of us um, who at the end of the day giving to God, I think God finds a way of blessing us. Yeah, Prof is in us. So Prof, um, uh, in your absence, we were looking at um yes sir. the challenges that we face the forces that we need to contend with mm. in life and um we apostle i just shared his own personal experience and we had informed the audience that yes very soon would also join uh prof osapo as the head of the department for the psychology department of uh, uh university of ghana Legon. and uh, to be a professor and to be head of a department you must definitely be loaded. And he's also the head of counseling for COP, Church of Pentecost. So 
he's here. All your questions that you've been piling since you were born, you have every right to put it to him. Um, <laughs> to the, uh, so he will share his uh, very soon. I'm sure mommy, if she's not joined, she'll join very soon. And then we'll and also be able to. Okay. All right. So, Prof, uh, over to you now. Okay. So, uh, what exactly, where should I start from? Um, you may want to share your, your practical experience, um, a, a particular challenge you faced, and how you're able to, um, how you're able to overcome it. Or you also may want to share and experience some of this challenge that um, came to you or came to your knowledge and how the person was able to contend with it. We are looking at practical life experience, something that somebody mm. somewhere may be going through the same difficulty and maybe think that persons we don't have those difficulties or those of you who are professors, uh, you don't have those challenges or those of us mm. who have gone through a certain period in life. So people want to be able to identify uh, with mm. what we are going through and that is where we're hoping that you share that experience with okay. us. <clears throat> okay. And then so, after that, then, some of the mm -hmm. questions that have already come, yeah. I will throw them to you. And then some okay. two are coming. We'll also let you have those ones. OK. Um, let me first thank you and thank uh, my senior brother, Apostle Nanai. I was listening to him. And, and I can really, I can recall those days when I also heard that he was coming to ministry. <laughs> the, I mean, all of us, everybody was, wow, wow, you know. <laughs> but I think, I think that the, the challenge that ministry poses to people differs from person to person. And it also differs in terms of the church culture and the church structure. So like, uh, like, uh, like Apostle uh, Alka was saying, whereas in other settings, people are very much enthused and happy to respond to ministry when they are called. I have colleagues, for example, who are in uh, some charismatic ministries and uh, they, they make it look very, very appealing, you know? It, it's like, <laughs> it's like uh, oh, this is good. And uh, whereas uh, in some contexts like ours and other contexts too, people are crying there. So it's something we, we would have to uh, discuss and discuss further. But I <clears throat> let me pick one quick thing. Um, I think that I, the toughest decision I have made in recent times bothers on wanting to come into uh, tent ministry in COP. And uh, I think uh, Apostle Nana himself uh, is very much aware <laughs> of the journey I've had to, to thread. And the, and the difficulties that we have had to surmount. Um, and so I work full time uh, in the University of Ghana. I teach master's students and PhD students. And then I have about 24 faculty members to manage with over five, four to 5,000 students as well. Um, and then I, I practice as a clinician. I just, uh, giving you all these various demands. And then I I want to go into ministry in Pentecost. I wanted a tent ministry. So when finally uh, we had to break through several bottlenecks to get there, now the reality dawned on me. How do you navigate? How do you make sure uh, you are giving of your best? Because what that means is that I need to, to, to work and work creditably well, uh, still in my school. It should not affect my teaching and my administrative portfolios. And at the same time, I must be uh, ministering in my local assembly, East Ligon. There are uh, quite a number of high profile people in there. You can't just mount the podium and be talking like that. In fact, the, the IMD is in my church, so I'm in trouble. <laughs> and so you have to you have to minister, <laughs> you know. And then uh, on top of that, uh, I was appointed the 
the chair for uh, the leader for the counseling ministry. So it was extremely tough. And three things I want to draw your attention. The first was that I I had to, it, it was it was almost like so the 24 hours that all of us would have to work with was not easy with me at all. There were times when I, I, I wish that I had gotten more hours in the day, more than the 24 hours. The, the second thing was that uh, there were demands at home. I had to attend to my family as well. I had to make time and do a few things. And so the, there, were, there were multiple portfolios that I had to uh, manage. And that's the second thing. So the second point is that the decision I had to make was to be governed by the laws of adjustment, which later on I would appreciate. So I needed to adjust. I needed to adjust. And adjust, adjusting means that there were certain things that I couldn't do normally as all others would do. And uh, I need to quickly address that. I couldn't make time to uh, do certain things, enjoy certain things as others. I could not. The second thing was that, um, you know, your comfort, you, you don't have comfort again. You don't, you don't have the pleasure of doing a lot of things because the demands are all um, around you. Then again, the question comes to you. Did you really want to do this? Okay, did you really want to do this? Do you really want to do this tent ministry? And so, so many uh, comments that will come from others on, okay, so when are you coming full? <laughs> and then you have uh, in your department as, a, as an HOD, I have innovations that I'm, I'm rolling out. And, and the university uh, wants to see more of those. So at a point, I was torn between two wells. Do you leave uh, to full-time ministry or that you also are seeing what you are doing and what I'm doing in the University of Ghana as also a ministry? For me, it's been one of the uh, very tummy and very difficult issues to still, I'm still thinking through and I'm still trying to adjust. What still is ministry? To and so, <laughs> trying to adjust. <laughs> I've asked someone, what is ministry? What is ministry? How do we define ministry? Um, how do we respond to ministry? It has led me to think about so many things. That is ministry um, doing tent ministry? Is ministry doing full ministry? Is ministry, my friend, <laughs> used to say, is this ministry doing quarter ministry or what? I mean, like, what is ministry? <laughs> quarter time <laughs> ministry, you know. So, so the difficult decision for me to, sum to summarize were the following. One, did I really want this? Um, is this something to take a second look at? Two, how best can I adjust to this? Three, should I finally decide on one and go instead of keeping this? I think uh, for me, I'm still in the process of, of making some of these decisions. And there are others that I cannot share here yet. So just to All right. Lovely. I can see that um, my uh, dear mommy, Madam Mavis Osafo Edu is, is joining us. Um, our dear mom is with the same university there. I don't know whether, you, but of course, if, if you don't, if your university is not University of Cape Coast, all other universities are, um, um, yeah, I don't want to say anything, but unfortunately she's with the University of Ghana and she's an assistant registrar at Public Affairs Directorate of the university. And so she's also a, a, a strong lady, well learned. Um, unfortunately, she's, um, I, I, I've not even asked where you school. Did you also go to Legon? Yes, I did. Oh, then, I mean, you should have gone to university under Christ control, UCC. What is UG? <laughs> what no, is UG? University under crisis. 
There's yes. only one university of Ghana, only one university in Ghana, and the rest. But this yours is yeah is in Ghana, so your your domain is in Ghana. We are under crash control, so we are global. You see the, you see the difference. You should have gone to a good university and then you went to Lagos. Anyway, all right. Yes. We are, we, are, we are contending with horses, and this is one of the horsemen, so. <laughs> All right, so, um, ma'am, you want to share with us, either your personal, a, a difficulty you have faced in life, that maybe somebody may have faced that difficulty and is thinking of either committing suicide, thinking that giving up on life, thinking that, ah, am I the only sinner? I mean, certain practical things you, as an individual, may have faced, or somebody else you know, a friend, a colleague, experience that you think that Isaiah, who is watching us or descent all the way from South Africa, um, would have um, lessons to learn from. So from your view as a, as a woman, as a mother, as a wife, uh, what, what is your take on that? Life challenges. We are dealing with contending with horses, contending with Whatever challenge, they want to raise an army that are unbeatable. Nothing can crush them. Nothing can destroy them. Yeah. So can you share your experience with us, please? Thank you so much, <laughs> Apostle. And hello to Apostles. I see Apostle Nanayao, popularly known as Authority. That's how we, we, we used to call him, <laughs> yes. When we were in Legon Pensa, uh, mm -hmm. he's an inspiration and we thank God for his life. And, and I thank you for this opportunity mm -hmm. to share um my life experiences i've gone through a lot <laughs> in life you know um from birth my parents my mother was um, a nurse she's a retired nurse now and then my late father was a policeman so um we had to i mean roam the length and breadth of the country um so schooling i don't think i spent more than two years i mean growing up in an institution from primary school, um, you go to a place, you're schooling within a few years, you are, uh, either your mom is transferred or your dad is transferred and you have to move. And so uh, we didn't have that stability, you know, um, of schooling, I mean, within the, the, uh, within <laughs> the educational sector, mm -hmm. I must say. And as of, as at now, I meet people, but they, they easily recognize me. That's the interesting thing from mm. primary school, as soon as they see you, they are able to recognize you and they will call you Mavis. And then I am at a loss because I don't remember them. Sometimes I remember the face, but I can't recollect exactly where I knew yeah, the face. Right, right, right. Yes, they will refer you because we spent very, very short times, you know, attending so many schools, so many regions. And then eventually we ended up in Legon, where, in fact, where I met my husband, um, so that is one of the things um, I have to, to say. Yeah, we all met at Pensa Lego. We were all in Pensa. So, I mean... Well, well, you were in Pensa to go and praise God and to pray, and you were meeting yes, and meeting. and to win souls. To win <laughs> souls. <laughs> and you want your house. Yes. <laughs> so we want, we want some for Christ, and then we want some one for ourselves, uh, so to speak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay so um so it's it's been quite hectic you know especially looking at the, the type of man or sh should i say the man of god i'm married to um he's in so many parts and one of the very difficult decisions i had to take uh, was to have left my job and um unite with him when he went to norway travel to Norway for his PhD. Uh, we thought he could shuttle in and out, but when he got there, the weather and the system was quite um, unfriendly, so to speak. The weather was very, very bad, you know, for almost six months. Uh, you are in winter and everybody is in their homes and doing your PhD with, you know, such conditions was a bit difficult. And so mm. you have to work for us and we had two kids at the time to join him. And then um, I was torn between what do I do? Because we needed money to um, 
pay for the heir, the heir thing. He was already there. Uh, as part of his conditions, he had to pre-finance before um, he would be reimbursed, so to speak, by the um, institution um, where he was at the time. And at the time, it was quite, I think we needed about 70 million plus. And mm. I have been taking some car loans. Uh, we, are retaking, we took some car loans, um, which I was still paying with the banks. So if I'm leaving, it means that I had to settle that before I left because we were going to go away for at least two years. And I remember at the time I was working with a private university and then the principal told me, Mavis, um, I suggest you go on leave of absence, which means your name will still be in our books, but you will not be paid. So whenever you return, you can come back because you are a staff. But the... Um, the implication was that you were not going to receive your ex gratia. I had worked with them for wow. yes, yes, from 2000 to 2009. And, and, but I needed the money. So, so he gave me those two options. Either you resign so that you, you receive your ex gratia to pay or because I told him we, we have some loans to settle. Yes, we, could, we couldn't just depart without that. So, um, so we had to resign. But the good thing was that they promised me um, that whenever I returned, because they enjoyed working with me, I was actually teaching them. Uh, they were always ready to welcome me. So we went to Norway for two years and then we had to come back. But when I returned and came back to the same institution, within that short time, a lot had happened. I mm. came and the then registrar was not there. The then vice chancellor, uh, with whom I worked, had, I mean, he had left virtually. His term was not renewed. I, I worked with him before I left, so his term was not renewed. And then new people had been brought on board. So um, it was difficult. I went back and I said I had done my MBA. And when I returned, accreditation board had come out with um, a regulation that if you needed to teach, you must possess an MPhil. And I, mm. my master's was MBA, and therefore um, it meant that I wasn't qualified, you know, to teach as a lecturer. And then when I went to Norway, I also realized that it was difficult getting a job because um, you were lecturing, but you, you go, their system is quite, you know, it's not as straight as ours. So you are a lecturer and then you go and you are teaching. So I said, okay, I would want to also have some administrative experience. And then right at the time, accreditation board had come out with a policy that every tertiary institution must have a public, um, a quality assurance unit. So I, I opted for that op um, option and it was given to me. But then, like I said, uh, so when the Bible said there arose a Pharaoh who did not mm. know Joseph, it is very true. Because mm. I was one of the, the first employees of the university at the time. I started with them. So when it comes to what they call institutional memory, I had it. I worked with the first principal, the first register. I mean, we, put, we virtually started the university from, from the scratch. And therefore... Um, some of us were held in high esteem. I had risen to a certain level. When yeah. I, I remember I was even due for, I could have qualified for Dean of Students at the time. So at the time I was leaving, it was difficult for them, but I had to leave, they understood. And then you come back and this person says, um, as far as I'm concerned, you are a new employee. Yes, and that is how I was treated. I remember I had given birth. Um, when I returned, I returned in in February, I gave birth in May, and I started after about four months. I had the appointment to start from September. So my baby was barely three, four months. So I was told that under normal circumstances, I was supposed to at least be given the opportunity to close around uh, two, you know, because I was a nursing mother for some time until, I mean, until after some time that I would do full day. But these people, the man said that the, the then vice chancellor said, as far as I'm going, you are a new employee and therefore I will not allow you that. And I mean, as a nursing mother, I got to a point, even though I had breast pass on, 
my my breast will just the breast milk will just virtually spill. It was wow. a very moment. traumatic experience. Yes, very traumatic. So that baby eventually he had to stop breastfeeding automatically because it it, it wasn't possible. But and it was difficult. Several times I'll tell my husband I want to quit because I wasn't happy at the at the job place and. It, it really taught me one lesson. It taught me human behavior. It made me understand human behavior so well. Human beings can be interesting, right? Yeah, they can be very interesting. Because some of the people... And, we have and sometimes with, queer. I tell you, some of the people we had worked with, they knew us when they came and mm. received them. But when we, we went back, it was like they didn't know us, so to speak. And so, but that particular situation, that is where I'm coming to. If you, somebody asked me, how did you end up at University of Ghana? That situation made me uncomfortable. It mm. made me, I, I just lost interest because if I just oppose the two situations when I was living and then the, the sadness, you know, with which the people sent me off and then the joy and the willingness with which they were prepared to receive me. And then I came back to meet a different situation and circumstance altogether. So my interest just, so for the next six years that I worked with them, I don't know how I survived, but I kept praying. And so daddy told me, this is, you, you should broaden your horizon. You should. So along the line, somewhere in 2016, we returned in 2012. 2011, yes, and then I started in 2012. So in 2016, um, there was we, we had information that University of Ghana had advertised for the position of assistant registrars. I was actually assistant registrar in charge of quality assurance at the time with this institution. So, and they 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 had um, indicated how you could apply and so on and so forth, everything you needed. So we applied. And then we had to do an, a, a series of examinations, go through examinations. We came the first time, we thought it was just a few of us. And <laughs> the room was full, we were, we were told we were in batches. So after one examination session, so to speak, they cut down the number and then these are those who have made it to the next round and so on and so forth. So from about 500 people, we went through the process and then eventually 500 people for how many position oh so we, we thought we were many only to be told you know that was the time the time we wrote the exam in i mean i mean the 500 people yes were vying for for how many the positions? position of assistant registrar i mean at the time they didn't indicate all they said was assistant registrar at the registrar's offices that is how you right, so all the five, put it. 500 of you were Going to well, yes, yes, one yes, position. yes. For yes, the assistant registrar at the registrar's offices, but they indicated various schools, and I think at the time there was a government embargo on public sector employment. Yeah. So for yeah. a long time, the university hadn't employed people. We were told right. yes. So um, people had resigned, people had retired, some some people had, had departed, so to speak, and they needed to fill the positions. But the government okay. it took. It took a dialogue in a back and forth and then eventually it was during our <laughs> after going through the so after the exam we didn't hear anything from them again when they said these are those who have made it to the interview stage we we're about 90 so we, we were quite many and then that one too i remember but by god's grace we went and we were able to talk the <laughs> the interview wasn't easy i mean the registrar herself chaired the function surrounded by you know all the people it was later we got to know some people couldn't even speak we were told i didn't know um but god being so good and um, we had favor i mean we were able to to talk and and that the rest is is history but after that we didn't hear from them again for two years from 2015 they're about to 2016 2017 so it was November 2017 that they wrote to us again via mail and said that finally the government had um, lifted the embargo and therefore we could. So we had our appointment um, invitation to come for orientation. Hallelujah. It was then that we realized it was just eight of us 
out of about 500 people. 500. Yes, who were picked. And then I found myself at the public affairs directorate. It's so interesting. People ask me, have you, do, have you done um, a PR yeah. or yes, uh, communications? No. I only offered English and linguistics at my first degree and then MBA. You offered English. That's why I want no profile. <laughs> English and <laughs> linguistics at my first degree level, yes. And then um, MBA for my, ma for my master's. But right. It looks like during the interview, because I remember they asked me what, my, my, what was my, my greatest, what I would consider my strength, one of um, the qualities that I had. And I said it was my ability to relate to all people i mean everybody uh, no matter their level and I, I was able to yes and it looks like they picked some cues and so when no said, wonder no yes. wonder i set a short notice um when i told you to come you're going to relate with me <laughs> <laughs> now what i want yes, to do so is i had to i had to listen to my apostle yes yeah, so yeah I you have done well you have done well I, I want the audience to know that uh, yes. with you and Daddy needs to be seriously appreciated, but it was such a short notice, and he didn't do, uh, you know. But anyway, one I'm Now, what I want to do is that I have some questions yeah. here, but for this, okay. uh, for, I want those who are already on Zoom mm -hmm. uh, to, if they have any questions, um, I would give you the opportunity, friends. Uh, you can just indicate, um, and then you make your question snappy. Uh, if you want to direct it to. Uh, mommy, that's fine. If you want to direct it to Prof, that's okay, or Apostle, or if um, it's not to a particular person, then any of them can choose to answer the question. Real life challenges that we need to contend with. We are not talking about theory here, and that's mm -hmm. why they've all given their life experience. We are talking about real practical stuff. Okay, um, um, decent, all the way from South Africa. Let's hear you out. Um, good evening, Apostle. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Go uh, ahead. Can you hear me? Sure, we can hear you. I've muted the rest so you can hear from them, but I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I've got um, questions for all the speakers, but I'll just one, 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 one. So three of them. Hey, my friend. Uh, to... <laughs> yeah, to Apostle Nana, um, how did he know that uh, the calling was from God for him to leave everything and uh, to come back to Ghana and <clears throat> focus on the, the ministry? And then uh, to Professor <clears throat> Joseph Osafo, uh, how does he uh, manage the... <clears throat> The, can the Christian counseling, like uh, counseling people from church and also doing it at work. How does it differentiate the two? And uh, <clears throat> Mama Mavis Osafo, what kept you moving through this traumatic experience? What kept you moving? So, thank you. All right, that, that's a good one. Uh, today, today, this and you have been a good boy. <laughs> All right, so... Um, Pro, uh, okay, Prof, let's take yours first. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me. Sure, we can. Okay. So, uh, the question is, how do, what is the difference that I see uh, with regards to those who come in for Christian counseling as opposed to my uh, my, at my workplace, if, if if I'm right, that's what I heard. Okay, so basically, uh, there is a thread of a difference, and the difference is that those who come to you for counseling within the limit of their faith always have an interest in you bringing a faith perspective to what the are looking for or what I mean the kind of a help they are seeking from you. What that means is that for example I've had people who tell me that uh, they are only coming to just request of me if I could pray with them for example. And there are others who tell me that 
uh, I want your view on this or regards to what do you think um, what do you think will be the mind of God about this and how do I detect God's will in this regard so so they seek the help within the purview of their faith and you need to respect their perspective within the Christian counseling discipline but when you move it to those who are non-Christians, for example, I've had Muslims approaching me um, to offer services. As long as uh, they are not pushing the request that they are seeking from me along their faith, I'm able to help them within a generalized uh, human condition perspective. I mean, human beings will go through challenges human beings who go through hard times. And so you are able to share a few thoughts with them and they are fine. They, they, they don't bring much of faith perspective to bear. But when they have moved to a faith issue that I feel doesn't work with my faith, I what I do is to refer them to a colleague who is a, a counselor and a Muslim. Otherwise, all those who come to me and they, are, they have a non-religious approach the difference is that whereas those who are Christians have a faith perspective, they want you to just bring on board. Those who are not, they just want you to just uh, um, provide some kind of help for them within a generalized human condition perspective. I hope I have been able to address it. All right, Prof, um, there's a question on, on Facebook. So take note, I'll, I'll come back to you on it. It says, I want to ask Prof how I, are you able to manage your home with all these duties, especially how are you able to manage your children? So I'll come Thank back to, to that uh, soon. Uh, then let's go to my maybe. Um, do you recall your question? In other words, how were you able to go through all this traumatic experience? What kept you going? Experience. So that yes, there's somebody out there survive. going through worse or yeah. similar things, yes. the person can learn yes. things from. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for the question. Yes, like I said, it wasn't easy because for me, it was shocking. Um, but then there is one quotation that we love so much. Um, I love it. My husband loves it. It's Romans 8, 28. And I mean, it, it's a quotation we recite. We recite every time we are faced with a certain situation. It doesn't matter whether good or bad, especially the, the ones we consider as bad, um, which, which reads that, and we know that all things work together for good mm. to those who love God, to yeah. those who are called according to his purposes. I remember when daddy was talking, he says, it gets to a point you are confused. You ask yourself whether did I actually take uh, take the right decision? The right decision. Yes. Yeah. Did I hear from God or I just rushed? So, I mean, it gets to a point you're you're surrounded by so many thoughts, and but then I because I I remember when I was in Norway, a colleague of mine who did the MBA with me. I mean, we were on this program at the same time. Set up an, a, a private university, so he told me maybe. It's, when you return to Ghana, I want to work with you. And um, they enjoyed our, our, the friendship, the relationship, you know. And when he was also done, he worked with us for some time before he moved. So he said, I will need yeah. you. I know you, you are a starter. You know how to lay the foundation for all this. You have the, the idea. So I want to work with you. And I said, okay. Um, at the time, I told him, but when I returned, so he was even the first person that he drove me to. I was pregnant at the time. As soon as we came, we we called him, we went to him, and then we spoke. And at the time, everything seemed to have been going well. And then eventually you call and someone will pick the phone, you know, and says, oh, he's in a meeting. He will get back to you. And that was it. So it, it went on for some time. I said, no. After all, my Wisconsin people, oh, sorry, I've mentioned the, the university, but it's okay. <laughs> that my people told me that when you come, anytime you come, we are ready to receive you. And, and so why not go there? And that is why I went there. But like I said, through that, I, I learned a lot. God, 
I mean, taught me a lot of lessons. Like I said, I, I learned one thing about human behavior. And I also, yeah. uh, you know, appreciated the fact that no condition is permanent. permanent. But mm -hmm. then this quotation kept us going. That even if we made a mistake, even if we shouldn't have gone back, but we went back, we learned from it. And as long as we are not, we are alive. That is, that is us. As long as we are alive, we know that there is hope. And as long as you have the opportunity to move on, you take advantage. So I, I endured. And it's, it's so interesting. I worked with all my heart. I did everything. I didn't complain uh, because I needed a job at the time. I didn't complain. I worked, did everything I had to do. And, and so, and then when we wrote the exam, we didn't even tell anybody because we didn't know how it was going to end until... We finally received the appointment letter and then before I approached them. But then when I went, they were, that is when they, they were, they were, oh, Mavis, so you, you are leaving us. And then I remember then the, the, somebody at the top wanted to even, we, we are going to, we can double your salary. We can, then I said, oh, it's not about the salary because at the time my heart was, you know, already out. Yeah. So it's um, perseverance, which is one of the fruits of the spirit. And then yeah. the belief and hope in God that, He's able to, to use all situations, all whether good or all bad, things. to turn all it things. out for your good. Um, great, great. All right. I've seen Nanaya and very soon I'll allow Nanaya to speak. But um, Apostle Nanaya, yes, uh, what made you so convinced that you had to, uh, what if you were wrong, but you, you were so sure that you left your huge responsibility opportunity to come and be a pastor? How did you know it was God? Yeah. Uh, basically, the inner witness, because there's some kind of satisfaction, you can't get it anywhere. Although mm. you're taking a decision, you realize that there's some satisfaction. You are, you are still in your spirit. That is one. And secondly, other confirmations, people from all walks of life thinking that this is where you need to be. And as you start, you feel that now you have arrived. And if you have this conviction, you are ready to fight all the battles ahead and you are able to go through all these hurdles. And you think that you, you, are, you are there. And out of 14, 14 judges, it says out of the ITA came meet. So right. out of the, the hurdles and this thing, they will land at your rival place. And uh, when we were in school, uh, maybe some co cool, realized that we used to do huge evangelism. We were touring op Operation Ghana. Travel to all the villages going to the end. When you get there, you realize that ah, this is the work you are really built for, manufactured for. So uh, this is what you can't get anywhere. So once you got into this alignment, you feel that you are in the rightful place. Thank you. Great. All right. Okay. So let's let's um, hear Nana now. Okay. All right. So so Apostle, um, uh, it, it's great to <laughs> you know to be here um, today as well. Um, it's great. You know um, also. I'm um, hearing from Apostle Nanaya for the first time and um, um, a prof as well. Um, this is my question. So a lot of times um, we hear, we, 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 we keep hearing this about secular and then sacred. We hear um, the kind of work that we do outside of the church as secular and then the kind of work that we do inside the church as sacred. Now um, with prof, you know, having to balance, like doing what he's doing for the University of Ghana, and then also being a resident minister at East Legon. I just want to find out, does he feel pressured sometimes to maybe prioritize um, what we call the sacred, the work inside the church over the work in the, at, at the university or outside of the church domain um, sometimes? I just want to hear um, his perspective of that that um, if he feel pressured to maybe um, prioritize it and say, this one is for God, I'm doing this for God. So I need to you maybe take my time, do it very well, because this one is for God, God is watching me, or yeah, <laughs> he doesn't no feel for God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's, that's a good one. That's our brother Elder um, Boating also connecting from the US. Um, um, I, I'm, when are you coming back? Apostle, I, 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 I was supposed to be on my way um, uh, tomorrow, but you know, COVID nineteen. No, I don't know. 
All right. I, okay. All right. Um, Prof, I think both questions have come to you. So the first one I sent earlier, how you're able to manage um, this work, manage uh, University of Ghana, manage the whole of Church of Pentecost, counseling everybody from pastors to members and non-Church of Pentecost members, and still be able to manage your home, and especially since your children. Any response to that? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Apostle. So um, I'll quickly run through three things. First and foremost, I like us all to be very much aware that we are all exposed to the scourge of stress. Everybody will go through stress of its own kind, uh, depending on where you are. And whether we like it or not, we will experience some unpalatable levels of stress. The important point is how do you manage your exposure? to these stresses. And so the first thing I do is that I am quite selective in, in things to do. I don't just jump onto anything at all. I mean, there'll be some times when my wife will tell me that somebody is, is calling me. If I am stressed and tired, I don't just respond to calls like that. The people, I just notice that sometimes if you're not very careful when you're going through stress, you may put yourself in harm's way by thinking that you have answers to almost everything. That's not the point. You need to know your breaking point and where, where to, you know, um, withdraw and rest. Mm. So, so I do that a lot. When I come pick calls, I will just send a short message that I'll call you later. That's the first thing I do. The second thing is that, um, the, the, especially at home, the kids, so some of the times I will just take them out and say, okay, let's go. We are going to buy books. My kids uh, read a lot and they give you a lot of pressure. That is That's a good reading. Did you say they read a lot? Yeah, yeah, they read a lot. They read a lot. That's, so, that's, that's good. Young people nowadays don't like reading. They, and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. They read a lot. So yeah. there's always, I mean, I'll, I'll go and buy for them. They finish and they will come. That we are finished. I say, go and read again. They say, no. We want a new one. A new one. <laughs> <laughs> we, want, we, want, we want a fresh set of books. And so sometimes I'll take them out and go and select some of the books that they want to read. And they read as, as a challenge. There are times when I enjoy this particular style of relating with my children. And I learned from my father, um, which is sometimes he can really consent, come down that low and play with them, you know, uh, touching them here, running here and there, making statements, and then they are just wondering uh, what we say in our camp. She them some tuli tuli, small small. Then they will be screaming, "Hey, that is not true!" <laughs> and then, and then you have the chance to engage them and find out about their perspective. There are times when some of them will just just knock on our door and enter the room and and announce it uninvited. And when you ask them questions, the way they will, they will respond to the question, then I will just engage them for a while. And why did you say this? You know, and then they'll be explaining, and we just engage them to to, to talk. I, I'm quite sporty. Uh, we we have this uh, table tennis board at home, and uh, we play a lot uh, on, on that with the kids. And then we also do a lot of um, what do you call it, uh, walking around or uh, uh, running, you know, jogging uh, around. And so we take them along. So you are able to spend some time with them. Of course, the devotions that we have with them, taking them, having devotions with them, all of these are ways of trying to just make sure you don't uh, uh, avoid, Oh, no, not avoid, you don't you leave an unbalanced you don't them completely. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so that's why. Well, my final point on that question is this, that sometimes it's very important for you to delegate what others can help you achieve. Uh, one of the things that you want to avoid in life is never at any point in time to think you are indispensable in particular things. I have heard, um, for example, uh, you call this the, the motivational speakers talking about 
indispensability of of the person. Uh, as a clinician, I take a different perspective to that because I, over the period I've seen that that has run people down. They they claim that they have read books that tells them to make yourself indispensable. But the other time, the other part of it, the coin is that when you make yourself indispensable, you virtually become the mastermind for everything. And the person mm. that comes on you breaks you. So there are times you need to learn to step aside and delegate what others can do. Let them do it. So you can have some respite. Whilst they are doing it, you are just taking some rest. So these are some of the things that I, I, I have done with regards to the first question. When it comes to the second question about from our friend in the, in the U.S. Uh, who, who is under the you know, under the, the control of COVID nineteen? Eh? <laughs> okay, so uh, that is that Nana. All right, uh, Nana, your question is a very interesting question, and uh, the, the question is presently being in fact is is a discourse even among intellectuals, especially. Um, those who are looking at the sharp dichotomy between the, the spiritual and the secular, or the sacred and, and the secular, where, where a believer will say, I have a secular job. Now, what is a secular job? You know, for example, if you are a believer and you apply all your ethics to what you do and you carry in God to where you work, in fact, anywhere you work, in the name of God and in, lay, and in sync with Colossians 3.23 that whatever you do, do it as working for the Lord but not for man. Then one will say that even what you claim to or you refer to as your secular job is a place of sacredness because you display um, the, the, the virtues of the kingdom at where you work. But we have faced with this particular issue of sometimes bivocating, you're working um, and at the same time for an organization, and then at the same time, you have to meet the demands of uh, a religious organization. I am thinking that first, or point number one, as believers, we have to be careful about this sharp dichotomy because it brings an unnecessary competition between um, where you work and uh, the God you serve. A competition in terms of where should I place the priority when a demand is placed on you? So if a demand is placed on me, where do I place the priority? Um, will I say God first and attend to the religious demand? Or will I say that this is where I draw my salary. And so let me just respond to them. So I, I think the first is that I see this sharp dichotomy. I, I just try to work at both sectors uh, governed by the principle of priorities. Because, I mean, I teach students, many of them are the children of pastors and and, and non-pastors and whatnot. And so, for example, imagine having called to attend a prayer meeting, and then at the same time, it clashes with teaching students uh, who are about to write their exams. I'll put the priority on the students because they are writing on exams, perhaps the final exam they have to write. After the prayer meeting, I can always attend. So that's the first point. I place the priority um, by I, I, I place premium on what I think should be a priority. And finally, the second thing I do in managing this um, balance is that I'm careful, let me repeat again, I'm careful not to create this sharp dichotomy. So if I am at work, working, I am serving gold. If I am in the office, and engage in administrative job and serving goal. The point is that whatever I do must resonate with my faith yeah. and draw me deeply into yeah. the work environment and space such that I'm able to bring 
the issue of the God factor to bear on what I do. Mm. So these are my points. All right, all right. Um, all too soon, our time is up. No wonder Descent was requesting for two hours. But you see, these are very busy people. And uh, to get even, I know Prof from here is going for another program. Apostle is also going for another program. Mommy Mavis, you can be sure they're all tight. But we will definitely have to draw the curtains down. We are hoping that next week uh, we are going to continue the discussion uh, with another crack team. If I'll get them back, hallelujah. If not, they will have to get with somebody else to continue with the discussion. But we have been looking at real life issues. And we've had our dear Apostle uh, Nanaya Waje authority all the way from PCC. Someone who has been a mission has gone through the mail sharing his experience with that. Those of you who were not here when he was sharing his experience, I believe the video will be on YouTube, um, on Facebook. We'll connect it to YouTube. You can go later and watch. We've also had practical experiences from our dear Prof. And then lovely have with us our dear Mami Mavis. And to all of you, uh, we are most, 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 most grateful. And to our dear uh, friends who join via Zoom and Facebook and all the other social media platforms, we say God richly bless. You make the uh, engagement beautiful one. I know there are quite a number of questions that we should have asked, but our time is up. Descent, uh, sorry, our time is up and for the rest of you. So Apostle, uh, Prof, and Mami, we are most grateful. Thank you for coming. And all of you, God, richly bless. I hope to meet you again next week. Same time, 5 o'clock, and by 6.30, we are done. God, richly bless you. Amen. Amen. Let me just ask... Uh, God bless uh, you all too. Uh,